Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions. I'm Anisha Gupta. Well, the India's festive season kicks off this week with Raksha Bandhan and will extend until Christmas and then New Year's. It will cover a wide range of festivals including the Shara, Diwali and one sector which is sure to gain from this festive buzz is the jewellery sector which contributes to around 7% of the country's GDP. To discuss what we can expect from the jewellery sector during the second half of this year, I am now joined by Vipul Shah who is chairman Gems and Jewellery Export Promotion Council. The DJPC recently hosted the India International Jewellery Show. Mr. Shah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have seen strong numbers come out for this one, but I want you to take a step back and tell us on how the first half of this year has been, which hasn't been great, by the way, and what are you looking forward to now for the rest of 2023? First of all, I would just say that uh, we, we have started the year with uh, pretty slow. I mean, so overall, the industry was down uh, drastically and for obvious reasons. But now, since after this IIGS, which has recently concluded, we see a huge growth, huge demand coming into the gold segment, which is divided into two parts. One is the plain gold segment and the other is the studded. We saw a huge demand coming in the plain gold and there was a lot of business and a lot of orders for Diwali took place in the IIJS show itself. And this was something un, uh, unbelievable numbers and everything what we, uh, we what we got to hear from the exhibitors. So currently, uh, a lot of international buyers also had come and uh, almost like from 210, uh, 200 countries, different countries and uh, more than 2,100 international exhibitors were present. And since this SEPA and the ACTA agreement uh, with the UAE, so that is also helping a lot to push the gold sales as uh, exports are concerned. As far as studied jewellery concerned, studied is a little bit on the slower side. Uh, it's because U.S. has been a little uh, uh, slow as far as uh, rising interest cost. And that was the main reason consumer is get, getting uh, adjusted to the new prices as such. But I personally feel that we are expecting uh, uh, Christmas should be good. And from starting from now, this uh, up to the December, and we see good demand and our export should start picking up. All right, that is unexpected lines, isn't it? Because when people go out to start buying jewellery, gold is perhaps first on the list there. But as you said, the numbers have been huge in sense of IIJS and we have seen nearly 70,000 crores of work being uh, estimated done there. What's also your sense on export demand for the various categories that you just spoke about? I mean, recently what we had almost like uh, the IIJS show, which we have almost more than 70,000 crore orders which has taken place, then that itself is a huge number. And uh, it's just uh, that everybody was in a robust mood and we feel that uh, the business is going to look good coming forward for us. Hmm. Uh, moving on from jewellery and gold to pure diamonds now, and there have been reports that uh, the prices of diamonds, whether it's raw, which is imported into India, and the prices of finished diamond, which is used in jewellery, also have seen a bit of a decline right now. And this is even as we've seen Russian diamonds continue to uh, absolutely be absent from the market. How is industry dealing with this? We do understand that uh, there has been a bit of a slowdown in Surat as well. So what is the availability of diamonds right now? And what's your sense on prices going forward? Yeah, Manisha, I would just like to say, see, it's all proper, main thing is on demand and supply. And whenever there is imbalance in demand and supply, there is a huge, uh, uh, this for prices uh, play a, a, a big role. So currently, even though the supply from Russia has been restricted, uh, and uh, in spite of that, the demand has dropped severely. And, uh, and we could see that also from our export numbers also. And so whatever, even though uh, with the current supply, we, we could not match uh, 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 the demand was much comparatively less. So the supply uh, pressure was always there. And in spite of that, the prices had started to fall. And now things are moving in a different way. We feel that now uh, the market should start picking up. We see a good season coming ahead of us. And gradually, we see our number exports also should start going up. And I personally find that the prices should stabilize, stabilize around these levels and it would be a good price for anybody to enter into. All right. So the diamond prices may stabilize going forward. But when we also look at gems and jewelry, it's big in terms of exports, foreign exchange, merchandise as well. How would you look at the various steps that the government seems to be now taking to boost this sector because there is this deadline put out to you for $100 billion worth of export in gems and jewelry? How far, how close are you from those numbers? 
See, government has played a really very good, important role. If you see the new segment, uh, Labyrinth Diamonds, they have started promoting the Labyrinth Diamonds. You can see that the reason behind it is that it is having the similar uh, similar uh, uh, cutting and polishing uh, uh, all procedures of what exactly is uh, uh, done in natural diamonds. So that is where government is seeing that no new mines coming up next if 10 to 15 years, then they want to take care of the employment side. And that's the good part what they have done. This segment also started doing good. And uh, only thing is what we understand a lot of marketing and promotion needs to be done uh, for this particular segment. We had a roundtable conference for both natural as well as the lab group. And both the segment would complement each other and both the segments needs marketing efforts to be done. And that's what our council is also going to look into it. And we'll be spending a lot in coming, uh, coming times for this marketing. You spoke about you spoke about the lab grown diamonds, but there is still some apprehension when I speak to people in the industry about lab grown diamonds. How do you see natural and lab grown diamonds and these businesses uh, continue to work side by side? And what's your sense on the price difference that we look for both of these? It's a good question, Manisha. And uh, I would just say that both segments are going to exist. Both segments are going to complement each other. See, there is a natural diamond, so there is a comparison and there is always a room for the lab grown diamonds to take the market share. But currently, lab grown diamond section is going to an affordable class. It is going where the desire for people in the middle segment, mid segment and lower medium class where they could not afford to buy a diamond. That is an area where exactly the market, market uh, it is stepping those kind of uh, segment where natural has already taken its position. It is for which based on emotions, it is on valuation, and that is where exactly it is existing. Both needs promotion and both are going to do uh, are going to do good as such. As far as lab grown, the price is what is falling down. See anything which is a technological product, uh, product. So any technological product is going to take some time. It will, it, uh, as an average, uh, you see new technology coming in, you will see again the price is going down. It's something like Apple phone. When you say come with the Apple 14, 15 new number, you, you won't say anything about Apple 10 or 4. Uh, means people tend to see the new things. So as similarly in lab grown diamonds also, as and everything, the new capability of the technology and production which is coming up. It will uh, it is going to bring down the prices, but I personally feel that it should stabilize from here. A lot of marketing efforts needs to be done for this segment, and I'm sure uh, this will be also accepted in a very good way. Hmm. Mr. Shah, I also want to dwell slightly deeper into the export market. We do understand that the US and China are running slow. We do understand about the FTA with UAE as well. Are there newer markets that you as a council are looking at? We are now currently, uh, see, since uh, as GJPC, currently we are working, uh, we are closely working with all the markets, which is because US, we are seeing a slowdown in US, we are seeing slowdown in China and two major consumer markets. So we are focusing into new markets. We are looking into ASEAN area, where we are seeing uh, 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 countries like Vietnam, Cambodia. We had a good road shows there. We saw people coming from uh, all the international uh, customers coming from these countries, which we was never, 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 never uh, penetrated. And uh, uh, we see the uh, markets in Southeast Asia countries, they are having a huge potential that economy is also good, that uh, GDP is also doing good. So we feel that we should look into marketing into those segments where we can find uh, where good demand for our products. All right, so there's a festival season coming up and plus uh, the GJPC is looking at uh, finding more newer export markets as well. But, you know, this is also the time that you start talking to the government, start involving more strongly with them and the budget conversations start way before the budget actually comes in. What are you looking at? What are the representations and how do you see the boost for the sector now coming? We are looking for uh, a favorable uh, 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 budget, uh, which is now uh, uh, come and going to be starting pre-budget session, where we have our industry demands, which has already been put uh, uh, placed in front of the government. And I'm I'm hopeful that uh, it would be considered as far as taxes are concerned. That we, we we have asked for relaxation. We'll be asking for relaxation on taxes, the, the high uh, duties on gold, which is also which we have been always campaigning with the government that the duties such as need to be brought down to be very competitive in the export field as such. So all these ongoing uh, ongoing demands from the industry and we'll be closely working with the government and I'm hopeful that government will be looking into our demands.
Oh, we look forward to that too. Mr. Shah, thank you so much for joining us here at CNBC TV 18. And with that, it's time to take a short break. But don't go anywhere. We continue the discussion on jewelry with Ashero of Malabar Gold and Diamonds when we return. Welcome back. You're watching Commodity Champions. Joining us now is Ashar O. He's Managing Director at India Operations at Malabar Gold and Diamonds. Ashar, hi. Thank you so much for joining us. The first half wasn't so great and that's exactly where we were talking to Mr. Shah as well. Uh, for the jewellery sales, what the markets are hinging on for the second half of this year. What's your sense on what the festival season demand could be? Yeah, the market response was very good. Uh, people uh, were very positive in the industry. Uh, like all others, we also have were able to get better uh, turnover compared to last year and uh, new footfall. And uh, like the first half, uh, we are expecting a better second half of this year because Diwali and other festivals coming uh, in the second half. And also our presence in the newer markets is helping us to get, gain more uh, turnover. So second half also, we are seeing uh, better sales. Hmm. So while uh, we are all expecting second half to be better, but what's the percentage increase and estimated number that you're looking for in this time? And what kind of growth and sales are you anticipating? Annually, we are uh, seeing uh, anywhere, uh, you know, 20 to 25 percentage uh, growth is uh, what we are seeing because a lot of our stores last year also we have opened recently they are also a good growth we are seeing so between 20 to 25 percentage growth is what we are expecting hmm. Ashar the other thing that Malabar has been doing quite strongly is the number of store expansions so what is the number that you are working with right now in India uh, like we have 185 stores globally we have 326 stores that out of that, India itself is 185. These are 185, eight stores were opened this financial year. And uh, we are opening uh, another uh, 39 to 40 stores this financial year itself in India. So that like uh, uh, India, the total count of the store become around uh, 220 stores. All right, that's a big number. You're also expanding internationally, as you said. So what geographies are you exactly looking at internationally? And uh, internationally also, what is the number that could go up by end of this year? Actually, by 26, uh, we had uh, planned uh, from our existing 325 number to, uh, to cross uh, 500 stores in India and uh, abroad put together. Internationally, we are uh, opening in the existing countries as well as adding few more countries. Uh, this year, uh, we have added UK already and uh, like Bangladesh, then uh, uh, other uh, markets like uh, Australia, we are adding this year and uh, uh, Egypt and uh, some of the cities in Africa also we are planning. So like four or five countries will be added this year. So all put together in the six years plan, we were planning to cross, uh, I mean, three years by 2026, we are planning to uh, cross 500, uh, 500 plus stores. All right, that's a very bullish number. Thank you for sharing that with us, Asher. Also, Malabar is the first one that started one country, one price formula. And we have seen other brands forced to follow that formula. How well has that worked for you? Actually, that has uh, helped us a lot. Uh, we had uh, planned this earlier also. Because earlier when the uh, each state was having different VAT rate and all these things, after GST came, like uh, the gold prices internationally, it is all same. And the import duty is same. And the GST came, all the taxes, the country taxes also same. So we thought, why to have different uh, gold prices in uh, different states? And we have e-commerce, uh, you know, from uh, different parts of uh, India, they are buying. So we thought uh, one price across the country it has to be 
implement it because it will give more confidence to the customers. And uh, in reality, actually, we were able to gain more confidence as a leader to implement this one India, one gold rate. Best response was received from the market. And we see that many other brands are slowly following to this one. Not all, but at least some people have started, some brands have started following this one. So it's a very positive note and giving a lot of confidence to the customers. Oh, well, absolutely. It gives a lot of confidence to consumers as well when you have the same price across country at the airport, at the mall, at Azaviri Bazaar as well. So that clearly has been a very big positive. But also, how would you look at the future of jewellery sector? Is it going to be about designs, branding, marketing? Lab-grown diamonds have made in an entry as well. And then gemstones like rubies, sapphires seem to be doing quite well. E-commerce is a part of this. Hallmarking has been there. So how do you see yourself five years from now? In what category, on what platform? Uh, first of all, a lot of unorganized sector is becoming uh, organized because unorganized, uh, you know, selling is slowly, slowly going down and it is becoming more organized because in the transaction, more transparency, more quality control and designs also, the new generations, be it millennials or other young generations, they give a lot of value for, uh, you know, the designs, even the budgeting, pricing, transparency on the stones being used. And uh, also, a lot of other things like uh, we follow, we make sure, you know, all the sources of the, from bullion to product, everything is uh, transparent, the policy is uh, clear, the sourcing is clear, because the purity is not just limited to the purity of the metal. You have to see how, what is the sourcing, how responsible sourcing is being done. And from the bullion till end, you know, what all processes you are following up if there is any illegal or non-compliant uh, elements coming in. So we control a lot of these things and make sure uh, the, the product that the end user gets goes through all these quality checks and all these policies. Because when a father gives to a daughter, it is a divine thing they are doing. So there should not be any impurity in the process or procurement to be there. It is not just the metal purity. So that plays a very big role and very we are very strong in that one. You know, the responsible sourcing as well as the responsible processes that we follow. Oh, well, it's a sector that's ever-changing, evolving even, and there's a lot of boost coming in from government as well in sense of recent measures and steps that they have taken here. Ashir, as always, thank you so much for joining us. While the whole industry seems to be talking about the second half of this year in sense of jewellery demand, and much of that would really depend upon the kind of demand we'll get from festivals and uh, from weddings as well. But let's now focus on a factor that will likely play a big role in the jewellery sector, a private weather forecaster, Skymet, has highlighted a 33% deficiency in rainfall in the month of August, which could result in India's worst monsoon season in perhaps eight years. And a weaker monsoon clearly means weaker crops. The rural India is a big buyer of jewellery and gold and silver. If the monsoons are not kind, if they do not get their pricing, then this is a sector, this is a factor that could impact the sector as well. GP Sharma, President of Meteorology and Climate Change at Skymet, now joins us. Mr. Sharma, June was weak delayed you have we heard you say that that's exactly how it played out in june july was a great month august with 33 percent deficiency now the markets are eyeing on what september would look like and that would really decide on how the festival season really will pan out for us what is your sense how are you looking at the month of september uh, manisha interseasonal variation in the monsoon is a one of its characteristics mm. july was good but then August is very, very disappointing. There could be uh, some break in between. There could be few days uh, when rainfall is uh, less than the normal by a big margin, all right. But then August never got up. Okay, right from the first few days. Can we imagine we started with 105% uh, of LPA in the uh, initial days of August? Mm. And now it is deficiency has gone to 9% today. Okay, we are at 91% drop of 14% is huge, okay? It, it doesn't happen uh, like that. It has been a very, very disappointing month so far. But the, the, uh, the, you see the deficit area, which uh, was earlier 15% in the beginning of August has gone to 25%, where the rainfall is more than 20% deficiency. 
this excess area, which was earlier about uh, uh, 25%, that has dropped now to just about 8%. This shows the distribution of rainfall in the month of August, mm. and it has uh, skewed also, but then it has uh, changed the scenario. The mm. pockets which were perpetually deficit, that is the eastern parts consisting of Bihar, or, uh, uh, Bengal, Jharkhand, East Uttar Pradesh, they remain so. The parts which had improved, poor monsoon zone, that's parts of Maharashtra, again it's plunging to below normal. Most pockets, Madhya Maharashtra, Maratwada also. And then uh, uh, month of September is not looking very rosy. Okay. Mm. August as such will close with a deficiency of almost about 34%, taking the uh, seasonal LPA, long period average, to 91%. It could drop even to 90% also, okay, which is just short of the drought hmm. figure. But then September is not looking that, that rosy. Uh, yes, first few days of September, there is a, some silver lining that some system, weak system, possibly is forming in the Bay of Bengal, which will give some rains over limited portion. So, uh, you know, my, my, my question is, uh, we haven't yet used the word drought, but when you yes. look at what Kerala, Karnataka, Madhya Maharashtra, Bihar, Jharkhand seem to be dealing with, uh, uh, are we announcing it as like drought kind of a situation? Kerala is... Uh, Drought, 48 percent deficit. What else? Okay, similarly, some other pockets, uh, south interior Karnataka, parts of uh, uh, east Uttar Pradesh, we can say even some parts of uh, uh, Jharkhand, Bihar recovered a bit, but then uh, many pockets in the south also, over central parts also, Madhya uh, 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 Maharashtra could once again go beyond deficiency of 20 percent. So these are the pockets which are worrying, okay? Can you imagine West Rajasthan, Saurashtra as such, it have not rained in the month of August. West Rajasthan is supposed to rain about 100 millimeter, it has rained 5 millimeter. Saurashtra Kutch is supposed to rain about 160 millimeter, it has rained 6 millimeter. What? This is a drought. What else? Okay, though we don't... Uh, pronounce it in those many words, mm -hmm. and uh, we keep calling it as a deficit area or below normal or so, but this is what is the drought-like condition in many parts, and the scenario is not improving, which doesn't augur well even for the coming days, beyond September also, in case September, you see all the water bodies, uh, they are consuming their surplus now, they are consuming mm. their reserve. I don't see it coming up. Okay. in September, which will leave somebody for the coming days, even beyond September also. All yes. right. So not a good news at all. So various sectors which are sounding bullish right now with the festivities and the wedding season coming in, perhaps may not look at those rosy numbers with the way the monsoon really seems to be progressing. Mr. Sharma, as always, thank you so much for joining us. And with that, we've come to an end of this episode of Commodity Champions. Thank you for watching.